Okay, so welcome to Early American Women uh, for OLLI, Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at SVSU. Uh, my name is Chrissy DeClerc Zalagi. Okay. Uh, just I think most of you know me, but there's a few new people. Uh, just a quick background. Uh, my interest in history started relatively early in life, and this is the era that really first caught my eye because uh, it was the era of history my father introduced me to through his uh, uh, his reenacting stuff. He reenacted uh, French fur trader, French and Indian War era with a, a group called the Brothers of the Wind uh, around Saginaw in the in the 80s. So that was where I got introduced to that. My uh, undergrad is from University of Wyoming. Uh, as much as I loved history, I was going to be a paleontologist when I grew up, and University of Wyoming is a fantastic school for a geology degree. Um, and so I got there, but then I changed majors. And then my master's is from CMU. Don't have the PhD yet, still looking for funding on that. And uh, that has not been great lately, as you may have guessed. So uh, one of my focuses has been women's history really no matter what I'm looking at. Okay, so uh, some of you have had the class that I did about women in the ancient world. Uh, some of you have had other classes with me that I uh, made sure to talk about what women were doing at the time, even if women weren't the sole uh, topic. So, so yeah, so those are my bona fides. Uh, we're gonna start, we're, we're talking about women in the Americas, uh, basically from the beginning of it being populated through uh, the post-revolutionary war era, okay? So we're gonna start with the people who were here first, and that is uh, the people of native ancestry. Um, yeah, so we're gonna start there. Come on, there we go, okay. So, we know the Americas were populated primarily by people who crossed the Bering Land Bridge from Asia into North America. Now I say primarily because there is evidence that some people went by boat, okay? That they may have been going close to the same route skirting along the land between what is now Siberia and Alaska and Canada. Uh, they may have been going the other way uh, on the Southern route, again, staying as close to land as they possibly can, but in that case, it would be not as uh, not as much. So primarily what we see is the evidence from uh, is what is now Siberia into what is now Alaska and Canada, but there is there is evidence that there were other ways of getting across too. They had to get to Hawaii somehow, the same, same kind of idea. Now we call this the Bering Land Bridge, but it's not so much a bridge in the way we might think of it, because we tend to think of a bridge as something you cross over with the intention of going from one side to another. This was not that. This was an opening up of the plain uh, that is on the, uh, the floor of the, the Bering Sea, okay? and it became uh, the Bering Strait. Excuse me, not the Bering Strait. It's on the floor of the Bering Sea. And that was because of glaciation. So the glaciers are sucking up more and more water. Okay that is exposing more and more land. And what you have is this beautiful, you know, uh, hundreds of square miles of open grassland that a lot of the prey species that humans went after like to travel over. And so of course, we humans are going to follow uh, our dinner across the, uh, the Bering Land Bridge and eventually end up on the other side. But we're talking about a period of at least hundreds and probably a couple thousand years so it's not just that people were walking across this, they were living on it too. There is evidence uh, at the bottom of the Bering Sea of settlements that were there uh, before the water came back in. So once we get here, once we humans get over to the Americas, most people live the way they had, uh, you know, since the beginning of human history, you have primarily hunter-gatherer uh, societies. Agriculture does not really come into being until about 10,000 years ago. Now, that is true across the board. Okay? Agriculture pops up in Mesopotamia, in, in uh, Asia, in Europe, well, it's not, 
Yeah, in Europe. There's not a lot in Europe yet at that point. Various places in Africa and the Americas all about the same time 10,000 years ago. Now, the big marker there is that that is the tail end of the last ice age. And that is also a time when we're losing the really big Pleistocene mammals. Okay. The animals that we could, uh, we as a species could go hunt one as a group and it would you know, feed the entire group for uh, a winter or something like that. Okay. So you have a situation where food sources are changing and you're going to lean toward other food sources that you know that are going to be more reliable, okay? And plant material, agricultural uh, material is generally more reliable than hunting. If for no other reason, then you don't have to be chasing around an animal that you don't know if they're gonna come around and you don't know if you're going to be able to kill them uh, for your food. So of course, once you have agriculture, food sources become more predictable and populations grow to the point where they cannot be sustained by hunting and gathering alone, which reinforces the agricultural society. Now, in the Americas, we don't have what we see ev almost everywhere else in the world, which is the domestication of livestock. Okay. In, uh, in Mesopotamia, uh, in, in the various other places where we see the, the earliest agriculture, it's alongside the domestication of primarily uh, sheep and goats. The dog was domesticated in the old world uh, long before, uh, while well, we were still hunter-gatherers because dogs are useful with hunting. But we didn't have livestock that was domesticated until we get to the point of being in one place and having agriculture. So in the Americas, because of the fact that you don't have these kind of animals that you can domesticate, okay, for the most part, we still see a hunting element in even the most uh, sedentary and agricultural of these societies. So just keep that in mind as we go forward here. Now, it is generally accepted that women are the ones who figure out agriculture, okay? Women are the gatherers, okay, generally speaking. And so they're the ones who are handling all of these, uh, the plant materials, and they're going to know uh, where they end up and uh, you know, where they're growing and, and they're going to notice you know, where, they, where they come up every year, what happens if uh, you, know, you just happen to spill a basket full of, of seeds and then the next year, oh, there's you know, a, a raspberry bush here or something. So it's, it's just by virtue of uh, familiarity. But we also see all of the things that are required for storage uh, of that food and for regularized trade uh, come from women as well, okay? Uh, primarily, we're talking about weaving, basket weaving, okay? Pottery making, okay? Both of those used to, to keep food, okay? Sewing, of course, okay? And, and all the tools that go along with this, you know, inventing the bone needle, uh, inventing... Uh, you know, the, the type of knife that you can use more easily to, to cut uh, cloth or, or hide. So. And then, of course, if you have surpluses, which are being put in these containers that are being created by women and the surpluses are being created by these women, then you're going to go trade them. So, you know, the, there's a, a, a wonderful coming together there of all that. Now, agriculture also prompts the need for a more complex society. Um, when you have a tribal group who, you know, you have maybe 30 people in it, 50 people at most, okay, and that's even kind of pushing it uh, for a, a hunter-gatherer group, it can be more small d democratic, okay. Of course, you are still going to have a chieftain, you're still going to have some type of hierarchy, but it can be more democratic than a settlement that has, say, a thousand people in it, okay. And it also changes the way people look at the land, right? Uh, it becomes, land becomes something that can be uh, held by a person as opposed to uh, just existing. Now, I don't, uh, I don't remember if I put this on the list or not, but one of my favorite books 
talking about early American history is called Wilderness at Dawn. Uh, it's subtitled The Settling of the North American Continent. It's by Ted Morgan. He's uh, uh, not an historian by trade uh, or training, except in amateur training. Uh, so he writes very well. Sometimes you get really good historians who know what they're doing and don't know how to write. And sometimes you get people who know how to write and, and then they write history too. Uh, so he says this about it, quote, with farming and a settled village life, you need an organized labor force, a storage system with a food surplus, and a trade network, all of which require some kind of authority and a chain of command. So there you have the shift in how the society is put together. And that's, uh, that's consistent whether you're talking about uh, the uh, tribal cultures in the Americas, whether you're talking about uh, the advent of agriculture in Mesopotamia, elsewhere in the old world, I'll go so far as to say when we meet aliens, they probably did the same thing, right? <laughs> and then as I mentioned, agriculture changes the way people look at the land. Again, from Morgan, uh, quote, farmers are in a different relationship with nature because they are working the land instead of taking what it naturally offers. The forager's attitude toward nature is deferential, but the farmer's attitude is territorial. Now, this is, this is seen more in the old world Okay, we don't see this as much in North America. You do see some in, in Central and South America. Okay. Uh, but North America tends to keep relatively open lands. Uh, there is a recognition that, you know, if somebody planted this field, that somebody else should not go harvest all of it, of course. Uh, but that has more to do with the maintaining the, the mutual survival of the group. Okay. Oh, and I will say, uh, talking about uh, domesticated animals, uh, uh, there is evidence that there's a quasi-domesticated wolf slash dog species that some of the tribes in North America had uh, that is now extinct. Uh, there were domesticated llamas and alpacas in South America. Um, and I think in Central America, you get a little bit of a mix depending on where you are in relation to uh, North and South. America, but uh, we're going to talk about North America for this one. But so there is that those few, but it's not a lot. And that's going to have a huge effect on what happens when the Europeans show up. We'll get to that. So the influence of agriculture is variable depending on the environment. Okay. Environments that are harsher are going to uh, lend themselves toward a more uh, reliable food source, okay? And so you have the tribal groups in the southern and western part of North America are sedentary and they rely very heavily on agriculture, okay? Uh, the ones on the east coast tended to be more nomadic. They tended to rely less on agriculture, although that doesn't mean they didn't have any, okay? But they tended to move around. Their, their agriculture was, uh, uh, you know, they'd plant a field and then they might go to wherever they live in the summer and then come back to it. And they're relying on that food source, but it's not their only food source if it, if it uh, doesn't pan out. Now, the plain societies in the American West, okay, and the, the one that we tend to think of always is, is the Sioux, uh, at least that's the, the one that seems always depicted in popular culture. Okay. These were sedentary agricultural societies, okay? Uh, like I said before, if they wanted meat, they are still hunting, of course, but for the most part, they're practicing agriculture, okay? And then after the Spanish show up and they uh, either intentionally or not let loose horses who then come together because they are uh, 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 pack animals, okay, herd animals, and they end up in the central part of, of North America, the Sioux decide to go to a hunter-gatherer lifestyle. Okay? They still do practice some agriculture, but the, the idea of the Indian on horseback, okay, as you see in the picture there, um, as you think of when you think of, of pop culture, as I said, that does not come until after 
the Europeans show up because there are no horses in the Americas. Uh, prior to the end of the last ice age, there was uh, what's called a three-toed horse, uh, similar to a European or a, a Eurasian horse uh, with a different foot structure, three toes. Uh, and those were either on their way to being extinct already or they were hunted to extinction by the, uh, the humans who were on these continents earliest. So it, when we learn about uh, the beginnings of humanity looking at, at the beginning of agriculture in Mesopotamia and that kind of thing, there is this idea of further advancement of progress, okay? And that lends one to think of agriculture as being uh, uh, one step above or one step better or a measure of progress in the society or in, in the evolution of uh, uh, the species, okay, toward agriculture, or toward, excuse me, away from hunter-gatherer lifestyle. So we tend to think of hunter-gatherer as being lesser, uh, uh, less, of, less developed, let's say, and agriculture is more so. You shouldn't think that, you shouldn't make those connections anyway, because they're not, that's, that's created by, you know, the people who invented history in, in Greece, you know, and who wanted to make it look like uh, they were the, the best of the best in all of society uh, since the beginning. But especially in the Americas, when you're looking at the tribal cultures, you can't make a quality distinction between agriculture and hunter-gatherer lifestyles because it is all about how it is best, uh, how, how one can best survive in the territory in which they live. Yeah. And having said all that, of course, <clears throat> we get into, excuse me, in Mesoamerica, and there we have large cities uh, large sedentary populations like we see in Mesopotamia, like we see in, uh, by this time, we're seeing it all across Eurasia, okay, by the time they're, uh, uh, by the time they're showing up, okay. Now, the thing is here is that these people left very few written records, okay. In terms of North America, we do not have a written language, okay, from really any of the tribes. Um, there is a written form of, I believe it's Cherokee that is created in the 19th century, okay, based on European ways of, of creating, uh, of, of having uh, uh, text, okay. But they didn't do that on their own. That, that was very specifically done to, to uh, facilitate interaction between tribesmen and Europeans. In Central America, we do have written records. They do have written language, but it's not used very much. It's, it's held primarily for religious aspects and of course some uh, chronicles of kings and things like that. The most famous example of this, of course, would be the, uh, uh, the Mayan calendar, okay? So that's a place they use their written language, but it's not something that's necessarily available to everyone. They are not a, they're not what we would call a literate society. They are pre-literate, okay, or, or non-literate, excuse me, not pre-literate, non-literate, as opposed to illiterate. Uh, illiterate is an inability to read in a society that has reading. Non-literate would be a society that does not have reading and therefore you also don't read because it's not part of your lifestyle. So for the most part, we're talking about non-literate societies. Um, little bit of difference in Mesoamerica. Now, uh, another of the books that I really like using for my information sources for this uh, is Susan Wise Bauer's works on the history of the world. Uh, she has three out right now. The fourth one's coming soon. Yay. She says this about it. The archaeologist can trace the rise and fall of cities, but the historian has very little raw material to shape into a narrative. And that's, that's, uh, yeah, that's very true. Historians work in words, okay? And now in the modern day, we work in you know video, we work in photographs and, and that kind of thing. But essentially we work in words. What archeologists take out of the ground is uh, very important to historical work because it can reconcile what we see in texts. But an historian, uh, a capital H historian is looking at texts they are going to consult what the archaeologists have to say, perhaps, but that's not their primary 
uh, uh, method of, of information gathering, uh, vice versa with the archeologists. Okay. So there's a lot of archeological material in the Americas, very little of what we would call historical written material in the pre-Columbian era. Now, at the time of Columbus's arrival, okay, it's believed that there were somewhere between 75 and 100 million people living in the Americas, and that 25 million of those were on North America. Now, these are shot in the dark, okay? Uh, there is some extrapolation that people who are better at math than I am that have made according to the populations that were apparently reported by the Europeans when they show up and also according to the oral histories and also according to archeological evidence of what settlements look like, that kind of thing. I have seen estimates that go anywhere from that 75 million all the way up to 250 million. Okay, uh, that's just, it's something we, will, we can't know until somebody has that time machine and they can do a Star Trek style scan and say there's X amount of people in that area, right? But if you wanna know more about pre-Columbian America, Charles Mann's 1491 is an excellent source for that. So now let's talk about the society. Okay. As I said earlier, uh, most of the information from this era is coming either from oral histories or the accounts of the Europeans who ask what the history of various and sundry peoples are. Really, if you think of it that way, it's all coming from oral history because they're, they're just writing down what they uh, have been told, okay? And with oral history, you know, there's, there's potential for a lot of contradiction. There's potential for uh, incorrect information to creep in. There's potential for a lot to be lost in the, in the interim. So we have to work with what we have. And of course, as I said earlier, you do have some of the uh, archeological evidence that backs this. So we can point to some of it uh, in that way, but for the most part, we're talking about what's been passed down traditionally uh, through oral histories. And even so, okay, even if we have a good solid oral history for one group, uh, we can't necessarily use that to extrapolate to another group of how they function, okay? Uh, you can assume some similar life ways for people who live in similar areas or in the same area. You can assume some, uh, some of the basics of humanity, okay, that, that are common throughout, okay? Uh, but it's very difficult to generalize to say, all of the people, all of the groups that were living on, you know, the North American continent, pre-Columbus, pre-Columbus, excuse me, uh, did these things with an absolute certainty. And if you think about it, of course, that makes sense even for the cultures that we have uh, uh, centuries upon centuries of written records for. You could not look at Europe in say 1300 and say that everybody was doing everything the same way. So it's important not to generalize. There is, uh, it's safe to say for the most part uh, that there are, that these tribal cultures are more egalitarian than European society at the time, okay? And they are likely more egalitarian in terms of social class. Uh, it's very difficult to maintain a class system in a tribal society where you may only have, you know, 50 people, okay? And even within the larger tribe, you're not going to have a class system set up the way, uh, the way we would be familiar with it. Again, as I said earlier, there's always hierarchy. Humans like to organize things in that way, but it's not going to be, you're not going to have that, that class structure that is uh, uh, contingent upon keeping a particular group at the bottom and a particular group at the top. We also can say with fair certainty that they are more egalitarian in terms of gender as well. Uh, now, this is not to say that the women were considered to be fully equal to the men, but there is, a, is an egalitarianism in the understanding of how each sex supported the, the tribe 
and the society and, and how each sex was involved in everything that was important to day-to-day -day life. Okay. And then we'll get into that in a minute. Now, the tribal societies that we see in the Americas are generally focused on the survival and the well-being of the community as a whole. Okay. Uh, you can only be as strong as your weakest member. And there is not, the society was not set up in such a way that you could say that, that any one person was necessarily, uh, I hesitate to use this term, but useless, okay? You also have a much more tribal way of living, okay? <laughs> Communal way of living, uh, where you have families who are living together in the same house, okay? Uh, like in the, the drawing there, you have a long house that probably houses three or four families or uh, you know, a few generations of the same family with, with siblings and their spouses and their children all living together, okay? And even in the ones who didn't live communally uh, in a house, you still had communal living within the area, okay? So uh, perhaps every nuclear family would have their own dwelling, but the community as a whole uh, is, is functioning in that communal way. It's a communal another time. And so a central part of this is the idea of reciprocity and of mutual obligation, okay? Reciprocity is uh, the idea that you need to equal uh, what may be given to you with something in return. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, you, know, you spend three days helping your neighbor with uh, uh, their, their fields of, uh, say, maize or something, and then they spend three days with you. Okay, that might mean you spend three days helping them and then they give you some of the crop or they provide cornmeal for you or they provide bread for you or something like that. So in terms of a more uh, particular, uh, uh, more dictionary definition, reciprocity can take the form of immediate exchange of goods or labor in a basic barter system, or it can take the form of gift gifting gift giving, excuse me, over an extended period of time. So in that, in my analogy, uh, your, the, the reciprocal action for the aid in the fields may be providing a, a, a loaf of bread to you uh, once a week for the entirety of the winter or something like that. And the thing to remember too, is that if reciprocity is not met, it creates a, an inequality uh, in the society. And so that's how you can see social hierarchy, okay? So if there is a person who is uh, being given many gifts or being given many um, uh, goods, okay, but they are not necessarily returning equally, then you can say that person uh, is considered to be of a higher status than the people who are doing the gift giving. Again, not class, it's a different kind of, of setup. In terms of how families were put together, we do see some tribes practicing monogamy, okay? Uh, in other tribes, you see polygamy or polyandry. The former is much more common. Uh, it is, in human society in general, it is much more common to see a man with multiple wives than a, a woman with multiple husbands, but it does happen, okay? So yeah, here you can't do really a generalization. Some tribes did monogamy, some tribes did not. Some people in a tribe may be monogamous and others not, depending on how the society uh, is structured. And even within monogamous marriages, sexual monogamy is not necessarily required, okay? Um, sexual monogamy comes into play in humanity when we start having inheritable goods. Okay. So once you have property that needs to be passed from father to son, okay, uh, sexual monogamy on the part of women becomes very, very important because that is the only way to make sure that, and you forgive the crassness, that the children coming out of your wife are yours, okay? In a society where there is not that kind of property to be held from generation to generation, the parentage of children is not as important. Okay. 
uh, in a society where material goods and property are passed along the matrilineal line from mother to daughter, okay, or from mother to son, was a mother to daughter, uh, the, the, who the father of a child is, is less important because the goods are on the side of the mother and you know, that's not something that's in question. So in these, in, in these tribal societies, there isn't a lot of, there isn't any, any of what we would call private property, okay? You don't have people who are marking off a piece of land and saying, this is mine and mine alone. And you do, ha you do have personal property. You do have the things that uh, uh, you, you have with you. Uh, personal property is the things you use on a day-to-day -day basis, okay? or week to week or month to month on a regular basis. And so the personal property that's there can be passed uh, you know, from one generation to another, but it's not necessarily a way of garnering wealth, okay? It's when that inherited property can create wealth through the male line that we start to get human societies saying that uh, a woman must uh, be virginal, and a woman must be chaste. Yeah. And because of that, okay, because you don't have that here, uh, there are actually tribes where a woman of proven fertility is more valuable than a virgin. Okay, so a, a woman who's who's looking for her her first husband and and who does not have any children uh, may not be as culturally socially valuable not culturally, but socially valuable uh, uh, as a woman who maybe has two children already, okay? Um, because she has proven that value, okay? Still always, you know, no, no matter what we come down to, <laughs> women's value is being held in their ability to produce children. Uh, and since we're the only ones that do that, eh, you can understand why that is, right? Irrelevant of whether you have a society that is monogamous or not, okay? The children tend to be raised communally. Okay? Particularly when you have something, you know, those, those tribal societies that are, are just a few dozen people, you're not going to, there's not a situation where you're ignoring your neighbor's children, okay? First of all, they're probably related to you in some form or another, there's nieces or nephews or second cousins or something. But also uh, the raising of the children, the conduct of the children is going to uh, have an effect on how, on your life in the future, okay? If you have a, a tribal society that does not make a point of teaching the children how to gather uh, agriculture, uh, uh, gather plant goods or hunt uh, animals, then by the time those children are adults, there's not anybody, they're not gonna be able to care for themselves and they're not gonna be able to care for their parents, okay? So there is a, uh, uh, a communal, under, uh, an understanding of the communal good of making sure that children are appropriately educated and also appropriately uh, uh, corrected when needed and taught uh, the things that they need to know. Uh, you can extrapolate this into the idea in the United States of public schools, you know? Uh, everybody pays, uh, everybody who has property pays taxes that goes into the schools. We don't all have children, but it's in the best interest of the society to make sure that we have a place where children can learn these things. Now, the status of women in any given society is dependent on how food is provided. Okay. And here again, we can see just a little clue into the differences between uh, uh, old world society and new world society. Now, across the board, whether you're dealing with agriculture or hunter-gatherer, women's contributions are generally going to be more reliable. Okay. Uh, the, the men going out hunting are not always going to come back with, uh, with a kill, but generally speaking, a woman who's out gathering uh, and, and then storing that which she's gathered is going to have something that they can provide, even if there is no meat. Uh, no, that's not always acknowledged though. So, 
So in the times where you see women's contributions as equal to or greater than that of men, they hold a higher social status. Okay. In agricultural tribes, okay, you see uh, farming done by women primarily. Okay. Now, and, and they tend to be the ones who quote unquote own the land. The land is theirs to use to provide for the tribe. Okay, because they're the ones working on it, not because of an idea of private property. Uh, so the harvest is distributed amongst the group by the women who are, who are doing the harvest, okay? Uh, in these societies also often meat that comes in from a hunt is given to the women to distribute. Okay, so a, a man is not gonna go out hunting and then bring home uh, uh, let's say two deer, and those are only for his family. No, that goes into the communal supply and then is distributed as needed. I think that probably depends on the size of it, right? They're not going to try to redistribute a rabbit. But... So, uh, right, so, so in the, uh, that's with the agricultural tribes. Even in the agricultural tribes where the men are the ones who are actively doing the farming, you still often see the women uh, as the quote unquote owners of the, the land, or they are being given the foodstuffs to distribute. Okay, so there's, they're still involved really no matter what, okay, in one way or another. Now, women were deemed to have the power to make decisions for themselves, okay? Certainly a family has influence, but in most tribes, a woman is going to have the final say in her choice of husband. Now I'm gonna say most tribes and let's say most of the time because there's always going to be circumstances where uh, uh, political marriages are made. And in that case, it may not only be the bride who's unhappy, the groom may be unhappy as well, okay? But so that happens, but for the most part here, a woman who refuses to marry a particular man is not going to be forced to do so, okay? at least on paper. Now, the other thing too is that neither her father or her husband are going to consider this woman as property. Again, you don't have that concept of private property, of ownership of things that are not your personal property, your personal belongings that you take with you. Okay? So we don't see a dowry, okay? A dowry is money that's paid to the groom uh, basically to account for the trouble that he's going to to take this woman into his household, okay? We also don't see a bride purchase, okay? Bride purchase is when you have the groom giving money to uh, uh, the bride's family uh, in order to claim control, okay? It is in some cultures, it's a literal purchase. You do see an exchange of goods at the time of a wedding, okay? And they may not be equal. And that's a, there's a lot of various and sundry that gets into that. But the idea is that both families are, both families are giving each other recompense for the fact that they are losing a valuable member. Okay, so uh, say the bride was someone who uh, tended to provide pottery, okay, for, for the family. Uh, the, the gift from the groom's family may take the form of replacement pottery for what that woman may have made over the next few years. Um, the, let's say the, the groom's family, uh, his purpose was, uh, let's, let's say it's an agricultural group and he does a lot of the farming. He's in one of those uh, tribes. Then the exchange there is going to be agricultural goods. Okay, and of course, I'm sure there's there's all sorts of uh, uh, just gift giving as well. You know, not, not things that are necessarily useful, but the wonderful and beautiful and and potentially frivolous things that we humans make and give each other. Now, in most of the tribes, again, most I can't say all, women did have the right to divorce. And in that case, the woman and her children return to her natal family, okay? Um, that is very different from what we see in old world cultures, again, for the most part, okay? 
particularly uh, when we have these two groups of people coming together when the Europeans start showing up in the Americas. Uh, in that, the, the comparison there, of course, is these Europeans are coming in, the women are property to the Europeans, essentially, um, and legally, legally speaking, let's say that because an individual's opinions about, about the women in their life might be different, but in terms of legality, uh, the women are property. Uh, the women do not have the right to divorce because property is not allowed to remove itself from the property owner. <laughs> Same idea uh, that justified uh, slave catching in the, in the uh, antebellum era in the United States. But in this tribal society where we have the idea that this is not, this is another person, this is not property, uh, there isn't the issue of inheritance and all of that, then you do have that reciprocity of the ability to remove oneself from a, a relationship. Now, women's roles, in some ways, no matter what human society you're looking at, tend to lean along the same direction, okay? And, uh, and that has to do with, with uh, a lot to do with what can be done uh, in, while, while caring for children, okay? Now, as I said earlier, in these American tribal societies, there is a level of equality with the men, but there is also an understanding that they have different parts of the society in which they are going to be, uh, in, going to have the authority. Okay. Now, uh, the quote here, there it is. Uh, the quote here is also from Charles Mann's 1491 as the one we had earlier. And he says this about it. Uh, the equality granted to women was not the kind envisioned by contemporary Western feminists. Okay. Men and women were not treated as equivalent. Rather, the sexes were assigned to two separate social domains, neither subordinate to the other. That's very important. No woman could be a war chief and no man could lead a clan. So you have a situation where they are, um, they may have equal stature, but in a different position. Okay. Now, as I was saying earlier, until recently in human history, okay, uh, what is quote unquote women's work okay, is what is compatible with child rearing. Okay. Um, the most obvious example with this is the idea that the men are hunters and the women are gatherers, right? And you just have to think about what would be involved in a woman who has a baby at the breast trying to hunt. Okay, it, those are incompatible. <laughs> okay, if you have to show up the baby along and you don't know when the baby's going to start crying, uh, you can't hunt because you're gonna, your hunt is going to be spoiled by that crying. Whereas if you're gathering plant material, uh, a baby can be screaming at the top of their lungs for the entire time and it's not going to affect the plants you're collecting. It's gonna affect you and the people you're with, but that's a different issue. Uh, this is why, as I, I said in the uh, earlier, in the agricultural societies, you see women doing most of the farming, okay? The men are still acting as hunters, okay? But in hunter-gatherer and agricultural societies, okay, those things, those quote unquote women's work things, uh, cooking, household maintenance, weaving of baskets and cloth, sewing of clothing, um, all of those things that we think of as uh, inside the house things, I guess, uh, are, are delegated to women because they can be put down very easily at a moment's notice to deal with the needs of children, right? Um, a, a man who's out uh, at a war party is not going to be able to drop what he's doing to take care of a baby, okay? Uh, whereas a woman, who is, uh, say, weaving something or sewing something, it can put that down without damaging the goods. Not always with weaving, but, you know, close enough. Uh, and, and take care of children as needed and then go back to their task. Okay. Um, the book you want to read on this, if you're interested, is uh, by a woman named Elizabeth Barber, and it's called Women's Work, The First 20,000 Years. Uh, and it's basically a discussion of uh, why cloth making is uh, assigned to women 
all the way back. And then she extrapolates that forward through all of the various ideas of what it is appropriate for women to do. Oh, and uh, there were women who hunted in these societies, women without children, women before they had children, okay, would hunt. So it's not, um, not all the tribes, but some of the tribes, uh, again, can't generalize completely, but it is not a solely male domain uh, in that way. And I, I have to assume that there were men, excuse me, I don't have to assume. I, I've, I've read and we've seen that there were men who would participate in the gathering. Okay, uh, so it's, it, there is bleed over, let's say. Now, women tended to be the ones who both transmitted and enforced the cultural norms. And this is because they are primarily the storytellers, okay? And just like we do in modern society, okay, these stories are meant to uh, explain appropriate behavior, inappropriate behavior. They're used to teach, they're used to correct, Okay. Uh, they're used just uh, for enjoyment as well, but there's always that idea of this is part of the culture. Right? And so you see, uh, you see that, that connection, particularly when you're talking about the creation myths. Okay? The tribal creation myths put a great deal of importance on women because of the recognition that women are the life givers. Okay. And so there is that importance given, even if it's different than how the society is set up. Okay. And again, that goes to the idea of that communal child rearing. Okay. Uh, if the women in the tribe are generally considered to be the ones who are enforcing cultural norms and cultural rules and laws, then they're gonna correct uh, any child who's seen to be breaking those, whether or not it's their child. Uh, and they're also perhaps seen to praise children who are acting correctly, again, whether or not their child. Sorry, I lost my spot here. Okay, so uh, a lot of the storytellers, of course, are gonna be older people, okay, older women in this case. Uh, they they are telling the stories as a form of reciprocity for being cared for in, in old age when they are no longer able to help in other ways or able to participate in the site in other ways. So the fact that women's day-to-day -day activities were seen as central to the welfare of the community, okay, that meant that women had a measure of political and social power. Um, women generally owned the housing and the household goods. So as in the, the painting there, uh, the, the woman is going to be the one who owns the pieces of uh, the teepee or the longhouse, okay? And whether or not she allows anyone inside that is her choice, okay? But she's also responsible for the upkeep. If there, you know, if there's a big hole in the in, in the hides, then that's her responsibility to to fix or have it fixed. And of course, women are first line caregivers for injured and sick family members. Okay. Uh, that's that goes along with the idea of being the caregiver for children. Okay. Uh, you can also be a caregiver for someone who is injured or ill or elderly, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Now, interestingly though, you see cultures where uh, men are acting as uh, priests, okay? And sometimes you have women as priestesses, uh, but in the tribal cultures, you see a lot of women acting as uh, uh, for lack of a better term, a medicine woman, okay, as the healers, but you still have men acting as those, uh, uh, the upper echelon of, of religious involvement, okay, so you have uh, priests and, and such. And they may be involved in caregiving, but not in the same way that the women are. And, and as I mentioned earlier, okay, you have 
a situation where the the food and the goods that the women provide are generally more reliable than that of the men, which is another reason why they tend to be the ones who are the distributors of, of food and other goods. In a lot of tribes, we see women playing a very important role in decision making for the group. Okay? Um, there is a lot more matrilineal and matrilocal uh, societal setup in the Americas than we ever see in Europe. Okay, Matrilineal, of course, is when you have inheritance, whether it's of property or status or whatever, along the female line. Matrilocal is uh, uh, how a form of marriage is defined. Um, if a woman brings her husband into her natal family's home, that's matrilocal. Okay, she's changing the location of the man for her benefit, you know, to, to the benefit of her family and with her marriage. Uh, for in a society where a man takes his wife into his household, into his natal household, that's patrilocal. Yeah. So, you know, and then in societies like we tend to have in the West where you just up and move out completely, it's, it's neither of those. So we have a lot of matrilineal tribes here, okay? Uh, older women are going to be the ones who have the final say on who's in charge. Okay? They may not be able to be chief, but they also, are, they also must be uh, uh, respected in the choice of who is going to be chief. And they can go so far even as to stop business at such a discussion and say, you know, we're not going to come back together to, to deal with this until, you know, uh, this person who wants to be chief has come to me and uh, made promises to the, the things that I want from them, something like that. It sounds very modern political, but you get the idea. In the nomadic tribes, okay, women tended to be the ones who said where they were going to set up shop, okay? Uh, moving for the summer, we're going to go to a particular place. It's the women that have to say, yes, we should stay here, uh, uh, give an affirmative on that. Now, objectively, you think about that, and there is a logic to it because the women are looking at uh, uh, closeness to the water sources, okay? Uh, primarily, if, if, particularly if they're the ones who are going to be hauling water, okay? They're looking at availability of either land uh, that's going to produce uh, uh, plant goods for them to gather or uh, small agricultural, again, as I'm saying, this is uh, the nomadic ones, but so they're looking at it from that aspect. Whereas the men just may be looking at it from the aspect of, uh, I see there's game here, or this is a very defensible position in the case of an attack. Uh, so everybody has to come together on that. And the women are the ones who are the, uh, the last who are needed to be to say yes. Now, I, I just wanna reiterate here, these are very broad generalizations uh, and that's, so, so don't assume this as you're, if you're going into say reading about a particular tribe, um, it's likely that they do these things, but it's not uh, absolute. Now in Iroquois society in particular here, I can make a not generalization. Uh, Prior to European contact, women were the ones who decided when there was going to be a council. Uh, they arranged the agenda that was going to be dealt with at any meetings, and they could stop the council discussions or vote down the decisions of male leaders if they felt necessary and give time for uh, reconsideration of the issue to use the same word I have on the screen there. Uh, but often just to, to bring everyone over to their side of things, as it were. Now, as you might imagine, things drastically change once the Europeans show up, okay? And there are a lot of elements to that, okay? Now, the Europeans show up and 
the first thing, first thing you figure, okay, uh, I, I jokingly say the Europeans showed up and they sneezed and half the continent died, but uh, that's not too far off. Okay? So you have people who are introduced to these diseases for which they have no immunities because nothing like it exists around them. Um, smallpox is a huge one, okay? But measles, okay, chickenpox, things that, that Europeans considered to be childhood diseases or minor annoyances, I mean, even some of the forms of the common cold, okay? Uh, uh, these are deadly to natives, okay? Um, all of the various uh, flus, okay? Uh, swine flu, bird flu, okay? All of those come from livestock. And without livestock, you don't have the exposure to those types of, uh, of germs and microbes. And so you're not going to have the ability to fend them off when they come in. I'll get to that in a minute. It also affected how the society interacted with nature, okay? Interacted with their environment. And one of the big breaking points in particularly the northern part of North America, the Great Lakes region, okay, is the fur trade. Now, the fur trade has an absolutely drastic effect. The fur trade upends everything that is believed about hunting and reciprocity and when these, uh, you know, when hunting is appropriate, how much one should take, all of that changes uh, in the face of Europeans introducing proto-capitalism, okay? So the Europeans would come in and they'd say, okay, we want X amount of furs. Okay? And then the, the tribesmen would go collect them, okay? And where before they might only kill a few of, uh, let's use the beavers as an example because they were almost uh, hunted to extinction in, the, in this era. And we're talking uh, mid 1600s, basically up to the American revolution and even a little bit later. Uh, Right, so prior to that time, it was, you didn't take more than you could use or that you needed, okay? It was to use a European Judeo-Christian term, it was a sin to leave behind usable materials, okay? So these hunters who would be going after, uh, before the Europeans show up and want furs, you're going after beaver because you want the fur maybe, or you're gonna, uh, trade it for something within the society, and you have the meat as well and all of that. So in that case, you'd hunt maybe one or two, what you need for uh, what you're going to be doing with the material, okay? And you don't leave anything behind, okay? There, there is something, there is some use for almost every part of the animal, okay? When the Europeans introduce the fur trade, and the way that they introduce it is, uh, is that you take the furs and you leave everything else, okay? You might take back, you know, the meat from maybe the first couple or the last couple, it's, it's there, it's, it's something to, to provide some meat to the family or the tribe or whoever, but for the most part, you're taking the fur and, and calling it good. Um, the, uh, the movie Dance with Wolves has its issues, um, but the scene, there is a scene in it where they come across uh, a place where the, uh, uh, where fur hunters, fur, fur traders uh, have gone in and killed uh, tens, dozens of buffalo uh, bison in order to just take the hides, okay? And that scene is very, uh, it, it shows very well uh, the waste of that, okay? Uh, so just think of that, you know, in the, in the, uh, the woods around the Great Lakes and with beavers instead of bison and a lot of other animals too. So they start adjusting their hunting habits to match what the European fur trade wanted. Okay. The other part of native hunting was that it was done only in its appropriate season. Okay. You did not see uh, a great deal of hunting done uh, say in the early spring, 
because that's when the animals are reproducing and you, you wanna make sure that there's more of them later on, okay? You might have some, but not a lot. Uh, you always, the tribes were always, I say, I can't say always, uh, the tribes were particular about making sure that all of the appropriate um, deities, spirits, however you wanna put it, were uh, uh, placated, thanked, uh, uh, appropriately uh, uh, dealt with in order to take these animals, okay? All of that goes, goes away. The Europeans introduce all sorts of goods that the tribes had never seen, okay? Or their versions of them were not nearly as good. Um, alcohol is usually put fairly high on that list. Alcohol and firearms. Uh, and while they are, they are incredibly important, uh, it's the day-to-day -day items that the women are using that are often, that, have, that, that are cited sometimes as the push for the continued interaction with the Europeans, okay? So the Dutch, uh, French and British, uh, the Dutch are here uh, for like a generation or two, okay? The French are the primary fur traders, particularly in the, in the Great Lakes area, okay? They're the ones who are, uh, uh, dealing with that they're also they also have a very different way of interacting with the tribes and we'll get to that in a minute and then the british the british are trading in furs but they're also just trying to take over the land okay uh the french would come in and they would claim some land certainly uh but they were a little more interested in interacting with the tribes and making sure that there were good connections for the fur trade uh, they would even marry into tribes. Okay? So there's a lot of, there's a different way, whereas the, the Europe, excuse me, the English would just come in and go, no, go away. So those, the goods that are coming in, guns and powder and bullets, okay, that makes hunting easier. It makes warfare easier, okay? Uh, so that is a highly, uh, highly desired good. Metal knives and various tools, okay? Now, of course, they had knives, okay? They had flint knives, they had copper knives, okay? particularly around, again, I keep talking about the Great Lakes, but uh, that's what we are. It, so they had these things, but they didn't have iron. Okay? Uh, a flint knife is excellent until it breaks, okay? A flint, the, the that's the word I'm looking for, the, the edge, on a flint knife can actually be napped more closely than uh, surgical steel used to be done, okay? Uh, and it's, it's sharper. Okay. Uh, copper works well, but we all know how malleable copper can be. So it's not going to work well for things that have to, uh, that are tough to cut through. Okay. But introducing an iron knife, okay. iron cookware. Iron cookware is a huge one, okay? It, there's, without, without metal cookware like that, there aren't a lot of different ways, different things you can cook in different ways, okay? You're cooking over an open fire, okay? Or you have uh, uh, maybe an in-ground oven, okay? Where you dig out an area, line it with rocks, put the food in, put the fire on top, and that's how it, it bakes, basically. If you want to make a stew, okay, or a soup or something that is, is a, uh, a liquid that's going to be over the fire, okay. what you do is you have a hide bag or hide pot, okay, or sometimes they'd use like the, uh, the stomach of an animal, okay, something waterproof. And you hang that over the fire and then you fill it with sufficient liquid so that there's enough of the liquid seeping through it so that the, the hide does not catch fire, okay? But not so much that, you know, you're gonna lose whatever you're cooking. So imagine trying to cook with that and then being introduced to an iron cook pot, okay? I mean, that's, you can understand why, why there was the shift toward the European goods, even at the potential detriment to the society, okay? 
Cotton cloth was another big one. Uh, the tribes in North America, most of them certainly did some type of weaving, okay? But not all of them, and not all of them were in a position to trade with all of the others uh, who, who did weaving when they didn't. So this cotton cloth, easy to cut, easy to sew, okay? Lighter than wearing hides in the summertime, that kind of thing. So you're gaining a lot on one side, but you are potentially losing a great deal. You are losing a great deal. Now, there's a, uh, this book, Many Tender Ties, which is an excellent discussion of, of tribal women in the Americas. Uh, I think this one is particularly around like Eastern North America. Don't, I'm not 100% on that though. It's a good book. Uh, the author, uh, Sylvia Van Kirk says this quote, it appears that even more than men, Indian women welcomed the advent of European technology. Items such as kettles, knives, awls, and woolen cloth considerably alleviated their onerous domestic duties. The notable instances that can be cited of Indian women acting as an ally or peacemaker to advance the cause of the trader suggest that it was in the woman's interest to do so. Okay. Fur traders, particularly the French, come in, they marry into the tribes. The women have to be accepting of that. The women have to want to do that, or at least understand that it is to their benefit. It's not necessarily being forced on them. Uh, and if, because if it were being forced on them, we wouldn't see it happening as often, because at some point a stop would be put to it, as I said earlier. Okay. Now, another book here, The uh, Women's Great Lakes Reader, which is edited by Victoria Brem. It's a source book. It's got a lot of different, uh, uh, essays and journal entries and newspaper clippings, discussions of how women lived, uh, have lived and continue to live in the Great Lakes region. She says this about it in the introduction. Native subsistence economies gave way under pressure of the fur trade to a system where fur beaver, for fur, yeah, but, yeah. Native subsistence economies gave way under the pressure of the fur trade to a system where fur bearers were exploited for financial gain and successful hunters took more wives to process more pelts, subjugating women to a capitalistic economy in which the labor was exchanged for goods and credit rather than directly meeting the needs of the families. That part of it, the need to process the furs, okay? You think about the fur trade, we think about, they go out, they hunt a beaver, they bring the skin to the, the fur trader, but that's not it, okay? Processing a fur is a very lot of hard work, okay? Um, you skin the animal, okay? You have to then scrape all of what's left of the skin and every, or not the skin, but the muscles, musculature and everything uh, and the fat off of the inside of the fur, okay? And then you have to wash it, okay? Get anything out of the fur on the outside that might diminish the value of it, okay? Like, blood from the animal that was killed. And then you have to cure it, okay? Now there's a lot of different ways to cure, uh, uh, to cure hides and to cure furs. Um, very common way to do it would be to uh, take the, the brain of the animal and mix it with some other materials. And then you just lay that out and work it into the leather, what, what's becoming leather at that point. Work it into the fur on the opposite side of the fur, of course. And that's assuming they just want the fur as is, okay? That's assuming, that's not assuming that they want it, say, cut into a particular shape, which compared to the rest of that work seems pretty easy. And I mean, it is in comparison, but that's another added step. Uh, that's assuming that they don't want it produced into some type of garment, okay? Uh, and that's assuming they want uh, a relatively raw fur, okay? Once you've processed the backside of it, you can also process the fur. And there's a few ways to do that depending on what your end result and desired end result is, okay? Um, one, of the most, uh, one of the most onerous, but also most, it's uh, uh, a good word for it. Um, the, the easiest way to do this, and I say it is both onerous and e easiest at the same time, was to have somebody wear the furs, wear the, the hides fur side in, um, because the oils of the skin would take off anything 
uh, in the fur that was uh, potentially, uh, again, would, would take away from the value of the fur. So dirt and mites and, and all of that stuff that can't just be directly washed out. Um, I say it's the easiest and also the most onerous because uh, at least in the Great Lakes region later on, that was generally done by slaves. Uh, you'd have a master who was a fur trader and they would have their slaves wear the furs fur side in no matter what the weather was, okay? Um, and and uh, that was part of the curing process. Okay. We don't hear about a lot of, of tribal women doing that, but that was one way of doing it. So, so this processing of the furs is a great deal of manual labor. Some of the fur traders, or excuse me, some of the, the hunters that were trading with the fur traders did this themselves. More of them had it, they brought it home to their wives and children. So you have that shift. Now, you have too the shift of introducing a barter, no, excuse me, not introducing a barter community, introducing a, basically a money economy, okay? And it may not be actual cash exchanging hands, we're not at that yet, okay? Um, at least with the tribes. It was more uh, barter in that it was goods, but it's still a, an economy that's based on exchanging labor and goods for, a, for something that is not necessarily tangible. Okay? I mean, yes, a coin is tangible, but a coin is not something you can eat, right? And then using that to exchange for whatever you need for your family. Whereas before it's just, I'm gonna go out, I'm gonna hunt a beaver, I'm gonna bring it home. We'll have the meat, we'll have the hide. We'll have uh, the bones to be used for whatever. We'll have the, uh, uh, whatever can be used with the internal organs, all of that, okay. So they've, <clears throat> the Europeans introduced a step between uh, the work that was done and the benefit that came from it. That was a long way around to saying that, but that's what it was. And then add to this that the Europeans wanted the tribes to become Christian. Okay, a lot of the interaction between Europeans and the tribes, again, particularly in uh, the Great Lakes region, begins with missionaries or missionaries and fur traders. Okay. Now, the Europeans show up and they set up a settlement and they say everybody around here uh, has to follow the rules of the settlement. Okay. The, the British setting up the colonies along the East Coast were notorious for this. So the first thing they would do, they set up the settlement, they um, introduce themselves you know, to the natives, as it were. And then basically they say, you know, you want to live like us. And the tribesmen may agree or not, you know, that that's, they may be forced to. <clears throat> many of the, many of the tribes along the East Coast were decimated by European diseases. It wasn't as bad as what happened when Columbus landed, that, that initial trip or the initial few trips, because by the time you have the English getting involved in the Americas, uh, Smallpox has already moved north via Florida from the Spanish, okay? Uh, uh, some of the common cold, those flus, some of that has moved north. So there's a little bit better of an immunity, but it is minor. Okay. And, <clears throat> excuse me, so you have people who are moving into the European settlements because it, their entire group is wiped out. And you do have some who hear uh, uh, what the missionaries have to say and they like it and they decide that they're going to become Christian, okay? Excuse me. So there's always a problem with that because on the part of the tribes, this person has now removed themselves from the tribe and they are no longer uh, able to interact in, with their tribe in the same way. 
Okay, because uh, if you think about converting to Christianity from a uh, a society that is essentially polytheistic, you have to renounce all of that, and that involves <laughs> renouncing all of the uh, what your family does, what your society does, all of that. Okay, but they're not going to be able to be fully integrated into the white community either, the European community, because they're still native, even if they do everything they can to make themselves appear the same, uh, figuratively speaking, and, and maybe literally speaking too, uh, uh, they're not going to, they're not going to fit in anywhere. Okay. And so this causes conflict, okay. capital C conflict. There's uh, King Philip's war uh, is in Massachusetts, Massachusetts, New Hampshire. I don't remember. It's in, it's in New England. And it is caused by the fact that two men in a tribe decide that the, their fellow who has become Christian and gone to live with uh, a group of Englishmen uh, decide that because they've turned their back on their society, they are no longer valuable members of society and humanity, and so they kill them. Okay. And then that creates, that causes reprisal on the part of the, the English, because the English say, well, you're, you're killing people who are co-religionists, you can't let you do that. And, and that's how we end up with King William's War in the early uh, 18th century. The other thing that the Europeans do is they, they start to demand that everybody around them function with the same laws, even if they don't know what those laws are, okay? And again, it go, back to uh, King, King William's War, King Philip's War, there's similar circumstances. Um, for the Europeans, a murder is a murder, okay? Particularly, you know, you're looking at uh, uh, Christians who are supposed to be following the Ten Commandments. So, you know, somebody's, somebody gets killed, that's a murder. You go find out who committed the murder and you act appropriately, okay? But the tribal societies <clears throat> had a lot of quid pro quo involved uh, with day-to-day -day life and with warfare and uh, with the taking of captives and things like that. So, so in the example, uh, an example similar to what I was just talking about, there is a situation, uh, I think this is what prompts King Philip's word, there's so many of those little, uh, uh, relatively uh, little, wars comparatively speaking to the larger ones in the, in the years, decades leading up to the revolution. But uh, there's this instance where uh, uh, two of the local tribesmen kill an Englishman, quote unquote, accidentally, it's supposed to be a hunting accident. Uh, you know, we won't get into that. But their, um, the response to that is it, within the tribes that a gift must be given to account for that person's uh, uh, value. Okay, just like I was talking about with the husband and wife and the and the marriage exchange, marital exchange. And so they try to do that, and there's a great deal of misunderstanding, and more people end up killed, and then we end up with a small war. Okay, because the Englishman wanted to just take those two men uh, uh, who had killed the Englishman and have a proper English trial and then probably hang them after uh, they'd been determined to be guilty. But the idea of killing as a response to killing was not something that the tribes did unless you were in, you know, in the midst of a war. And even then, sometimes not. Okay? Because what you're doing then is you're, you're reducing the ability of the whole uh, to survive. So they didn't want to turn over the two men. Uh, the tribe didn't. Uh, the English started demanding that they uh, start acting like them, basically. And then you have this used to uh, this type of thing used to take land from them as well, because the tribesmen were accustomed to uh, the methods of the season. Okay, so there's a time at at planting time, you have a lot of work in a small amount of time, and then you're going to have some leisure afterward. But the Europeans have come to this idea of, uh, uh, you know, you have a certain amount of type of work to do every day and you need to be working every day. And so they said that the tribes were lazy, right? And they use that as an excuse to take the land. 
saying that they weren't using it correctly. Therefore, it should be able to be taken by someone who's going to quote unquote use it correctly. Okay. Uh, they would hold tribes uh, to the same rules uh, as uh, they held their own citizens, whether or not they were part of the community. So you have a tribe that's a mile away uh, that is, in the case of the Puritans, not respecting the Sabbath was a huge problem. And you know the tribesmen don't care. They don't. They don't celebrate the Sabbath. They're not Christian. There's no reason for them to recognize this. But that's a crime to these Puritans. So then they're they're trying to prosecute them for that. So it's it's a huge it's a huge mess. Okay. And they don't reciprocate with accommodations. Okay. They expect the tribes to become European but they don't try to become tribal. Okay. Again, with the exception of some of the French fur traders. Okay. You do see some of that, but that's much more common in places where you have a small number of Europeans uh, working, interacting with a very large number of, uh, of Native Americans as opposed to what the, the English were trying to do, which is push them out. So you don't see them saying, oh, you know what? Uh, maybe it is a better thing to not uh, just execute people because those people may be valuable to the the good of the community. Otherwise, you know, they're not, they're, no, they're coming into the saying our way is the best, that's it, period. And so after a while, okay, as the tribes realize that there isn't going to be that shift, okay, they start moving more toward how the Europeans function, okay. So they shift to a more patriarchal structure. They push women more into positions of uh, 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 lesser positions, okay, subordinate positions. Um, and they start trying to function with that whole idea of the uh, male breadwinner, uh, female household, house taker, okay, uh, and child giver, or child, child carer, okay, child bearer and child carer. And so, again, you have this massive change of culture. And then as they adopt Christianity, okay, they start using that and applying that to the society and, and that putting women in the subordinate positions. So over the course of a couple of generations, there is this drastic change for how the tribes live. And it's not just for the women or just for the men, it's, it's across the board. Yeah. And the last part of this that causes uh, so much devastation is disease. I started talking about this earlier because I had my, I thought I had my slides flip flop. So the European, okay, Europeans uh, in this era, in the old world, are living in very close contact with domesticated animals. Okay. Um, you think nowadays, you know, we have close contact, we have dogs, we have cats, we might have a bird, you might have a hamster or something, okay? Um, you have some close contact maybe with the animals in your yard, if you feed the squirrels, whatever. And because you're dealing with mammals, viruses can pass in between, okay? And when you introduce those viruses to a society that does not have livestock that does not have domesticated animals from which these diseases come, there is no way for them, uh, for, for their immune systems to deal with it, okay? So smallpox is a huge one, but smallpox would kill almost anybody, okay? Europeans were, uh, uh, Europeans could die of smallpox, not as commonly, um, as, as the tribes did, because it was almost 100% death rate for the tribes, but it did kill them. Um, the influenzas, of course, those are going to kill Europeans, but not as often. Chicken pox and measles are very rarely going to kill Europeans. In the case of measles, it might leave you debilitated, but it's not necessarily going to kill you. Um, they're considered annoyances, childhood diseases, okay? Um, but that can kill too, okay? Particularly like child, if, if, uh, chicken pox introduced to an adult population produces shingles, which is uh, uh, considerably worse than just chicken pox. So it's, it, it is this, 
this issue of just introducing a virus, many viruses into a place that has no potential for immunity. If you've ever seen, I'm sure you've seen a red uh, War of the Worlds, right? It's the little viruses. And for people who like to think that at some point we're going to uh, encounter extraterrestrials, uh, the likelihood of that being, you know, nice, fun, and Star Trekky uh, versus more like the Colombian uh, experience where you have somebody show up and sneeze and half the population dies, it's much more likely to be the latter. But We'll worry about that when we come to it. Now you say to yourself, did these people have no diseases at all? Well, certainly not. Okay. Uh, the fewer because of the lack of interaction with domesticated animals, but they did have diseases, okay? The one disease that we can point to with 99% surety as coming from the Americas into Europe is syphilis. Syphilis uh, uh, is a sexually transmitted disease, okay? Um, it causes, I hope nobody's eating lunch right now. It causes uh, pustules to form around the genitals. It causes uh, uh, oozing, uh, all of that. It just, it's, it's really disgusting what it does. And eventually will kill you, okay? Uh, that gets introduced to Europe, which has the odd side effect of producing uh, uh, the piece of garment called a cod piece, which is that thing that looks, that you see in like Shakespearean plays where uh, the men have the tight tights, but they're wearing something that looks like a cup on the outside. So that's a different thing entirely. So the Europeans are introduced to syphilis. I always say that tells you what was happening as soon as they got off the boats and you can damn well guarantee that it was not consensual. And then last but not least, of course, where you're seeing missionaries first, of course, those missionaries are carrying the same diseases. Okay. And a lot of missionaries used it as a means to indicate that their God was uh, more powerful. Okay. Because it, you know, you'd have the missionary would come in, the missionary would preach, the natives would go, that's nice, we're gonna go on about our business. And then people start getting sick. And then maybe some of them think, well, you know, this is a punishment from the God of that missionary. So maybe I'm going to convert. And then some of the people who convert survive. Okay. And so then that makes it look even worse. And, and it snowballs from there. Uh, it didn't always work out that way. Sometimes people would get sick. They'd recognize that uh, it was the fault of the missionary, whether they blamed the missionary's God or not, uh, and, and just kill the missionary because he brought the disease in. So. Um, <coughs> excuse me. There's not a really good note to end this on because <laughs> we're going into the colonial era where it's just going to be, you know, the, the tribes are being devastated. Uh, the Europeans are con colonizing and taking over. And, and so there's not really a, a happy place to end this right here. Um, but there, it's an interesting place to end it. And, uh, so I'm not gonna say that I uh, hope you enjoyed this, but I hope you found it interesting. Uh, we're a smidge early, so we got time for questions. I'm gonna unshare my screen and uh, we'll go from there. Okay. And I'm gonna stop the recording too, so you can feel free to ask